dámy a pánové, tady je Sara Polak. Uh, dnes je tady se mnou uh, můj nejlepší kamarád z Vejšky. Uh, a já teďka se přepnu s dovolením do angličtiny, protože to není nikdo jiný než major, pozor, major Edmund Owen, uh, se kterým jsme studovali na St. Hughes uh, archeologie a antropologii a který je nyní v britské armádě. A bude nám povídat nejenom o historii technologií, ale zároveň o technologiích uh, v uh, armádě, jak se k ním staví, jak se, jak se s nimi funguje strategicky a tedy, ale hlavně se těším, se spolu pokecáme. So I'm switching back uh, to the to the English of the Empire. Hello, hello, Edmund. <laughs> Hi, Sora. How are you? Good to see you again. <laughs> yes, I'm well. I love that that formal um, introduction you just gave me. Hello. I I hope you're well. G- good good to see you. Haven't seen each other for a long <laughs> time. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got to keep standards up, don't we? Yes, absolutely. Yes, Major Edmund Owen. Congratulations on your promotion, <laughs> by the way. Um, Thank was, you very much. I was just giving an intro in Czech, which you don't understand, despite like we've been friends for 13 long years, but you still haven't learned the language of my people. But um, I was just saying Good that thing. today we'll be uh, talking about... Um, because Pioneers talks us about the uh, interplay of society and tech. Obviously, we did our Arkanamth together, so uh, talking, chatting some breeze about uh, the, the history of technology, but also I'm really curious about how you use uh, technology strategically in the army and how the, the British army is, is approaching that because British army has always pioneered technology um, in, in a lot of different ways. So, uh, but before I get to that, it's, I think, very important to mention here that whatever you say uh, during the duration of this podcast is not the official opinion of the the British Army. It's uh, the official yeah. opinion of Edmund Owen in flesh and blood. Is that right? <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Almost as good, but not quite. Uh, a close second to the British Army, a- as with all things. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, Edmund, thank you so much for uh, being on uh, uh, here with me. It's so good that we get to get to chat and sell it off as work. That's great. Um, I, I remember that. Uh, how long ago was this? I think two years that I was on a holiday in Bulgaria with my mum. And uh, yeah. we did a talk together for the Aspen Institute uh, about the cloud oh, yeah. civilizations. And I was you know, chatting my big theories about how the concept of the nation state is going to be challenged by the internet. And then you basically said, but what if we plug the computer out of the socket and pretty much <laughs> absolutely nailed my argument. <laughs> so, <Will> it- <laughs> yeah. Go for it. It's 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 one of those big questions, you know, that that I think in the army that, that we're very focused on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when it when it comes to technology, is is an over reliance on technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so obviously you've got these great new things, and I'm sure we'll also things like Starlink, for example. You know, if you lose that connection, or you know, if you're flying drones, if it gets jammed by um, EW electronic warfare. Mm. If your AI doesn't work, what if the what if the what if the, if you've always got a red team or war game is uh, is is what we what we call it, um, and think about you know what happens if you lose technology because mm-hmm. obviously we can't over rely. Um, so yeah, that I think that 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 that's one of the big things that uh, yeah we always try to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I actually like it's super interesting because one of the things that we brought up like those those um, like couple of years ago in that discussion was um, yeah. the role of the state and basically like of like the you know the the, the national interest versus the private interest because obviously like the state doesn't always innovate in the in the fastest of ways unless you're Israel and your startup scene is very closely connected to the army um, uh, but for example Starling which is basically a private enterprise you know there's been a huge discussion about like you know Elon Musk supplying potentially Starling uh, Starling to Russia uh, simultaneously yep. when the war started the fact that he was able to supply it to Ukraine meant that the Ukraine was very independent when it came to um, having that connectivity that could otherwise have been compromised by the Russian side so I'm just curious in the case of uh, Britain, and I well, understand that you can't go like entirely into detail, but what is your personal opinion on having the private sector would, versus the, the public sector and like the interplay of those big tech yes. players that basically have almost the same strength and importance in some senses, uh, li- like, like, like the state, you know, in cases like Facebook or Google, which are absolute giants. Yeah. No, I mean it's really interesting points. We we were discussing this. So I'm currently on um, my um, sort of major profession course, and we we're discussing it the other day. So, I mean, slightly slightly worrying actually. So, so Starlink, um, they the Ukrainians. I'm trying to think about how I can talk about this. The Ukrainians <laughs> want to conduct an activity, mm-hmm. a kinetic activity against the Russians in a specific area, and um, Elon Musk basically said no. Uh, mm. So you you know you won't use Starlink to be able to do this, and Starlink was the only way that they could conduct that activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now you've got this situation where uh, someone that isn't in the military at all is is you know completely outside body. Mm-hmm. 
um, is dictating military actions, mm. which is very, very worrying. Mm. Um, you know, the, specific, uh, the specifics of Ukraine might not necessarily sort of align to any sort of conventional war. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, it's, you know, Starlink is the way forward, right? You know, they say that by, uh, you know, the 5,000 satellites I think they have at the moment, they're looking to get 34,000 plus yeah. up. You know, it's going to be one of the main ways of getting the internet. But, you know, uh, what does one do if it's controlled by a non-state actor? It's it's a really, really big question. You yeah. Know? And again, it's, it's do do we rely on it or do we not? Um yeah, sorry. Uh, does that sort of? I think that that answers your question. Oh, completely. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And really? I'm, I, I actually got a, a a bit of a mind to take this question to uh, the, the the historical level because I was geeking out over yeah. the origins of ballistic missiles, which is the East India Company kind of originally came across um, in um, uh, in India and then actually used them very successfully against uh, Napoleon as well. So there was like this whole technology transfer from a private company picking it up in what was not yet uh, like a, a, a colony, but more of like Wait. a trading outpost. And then eventually using that, you know, 150 odd years later, no, 100 years later to uh, to defeat Napoleon. So this is really like very interesting uh, kind of like connection. And then you've got the Fau Einses and the Fau Zweis. And then from that, you've got Saturn V that takes people to the moon. So what I'm interested exactly. in, like with the historical, kind of connection as well is that the the military is often a, a kind of breeding ground for like cutting edge tech because if you want cutting edge tech for education everyone's like yeah it's very important but fundamentally no one really gives a shit because it's not a pressing thing uh, if you have a war on and like it's about your existence or non-existence suddenly <laughs> that becomes uh, a lot more acute so i'm just i'm just wondering like how um britain obviously like you're you're <laughs> no, no longer the the the, the empire um uh, with, with a lot of connotations that you once were, but nonetheless, like you're, you're a uh, you know uh, m military might and like a military superpower in a lot of ways. So, so how do you strategically approach innovating these technologies? Um, like, how do you uh, how do you accelerate technologies within the army? So, uh, it's a really good question. So, you sort of. But bringing it back down to sort of like to, to the real basic level, so um, in the British Army as an officer, there are five career streams that you can go down. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the operations career stream, operations support, uh, management of defence, defence engagement, and then the last one is capability and acquisition. Mm -hmm. So um, that effectively, if you want to go down that route, it's actually a pretty uh, is good route. So if you want to get promoted, mm -hmm. uh, but you do need to understand maths, which I don't, so I'm, I'm <laughs> st sticking well. Hello, yeah, that. me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but so what it does is that, um, so as a junior major, so you've just promoted a major, you go to staff college, and then after that, you will then go to a, a Kaepernick aligned job. Mm -hmm. And the thinking is that over time, you'll create deep specialists. So you sort of specialize probably in one field, so say communications or, you know, weapons platforms or whatever. So I think, so the, the thinking behind it is that, you know, in the future, this, this will um, so enable us far more to understand what it is that we need now, what it is that we're going to need in the future as well. Because they're, they're very, um, they're two very, very different mm -hmm. things and it's mm -hmm. incredibly difficult to plan out, you know, with the, so then you've got the other side, which is the sort of procurement side. Um, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people know at the moment, you know, the British Army, we we haven't been great at procurement. Um, oh, I think really? that's sort of that wide, widely accepted. Yeah. So, so the new platform uh, is called known as Ajax. So mm -hmm. it's, it's supposed to come into um, a sort of medium, medium uh, we weapons platform, medium sized weapons platform. Uh, and uh, it, not not going to the detail of it, but effectively we've a uh, British Army asked for all these changes to it, and uh, it's it's created a huge huge delay, uh -huh. massive um, sort of financial um, sort of tail that that that's sort of associated with that. And so, you know, the British Army, I think you know historically we we haven't necessarily been as good as we should be, but I think we are getting after that. We're uh, we're focusing, you know, future wise uh, by enabling our people and training yeah. our people. The other side of this is that we also, uh, sorry, uh, well, yeah, the other side of this also that we um, integrate uh, the, uh, the the civil sector mm -hmm, as well into mm -hmm. what we do. So on the camp that I'm in in Trivenham, we've got um, the uh, sort of aviation safety guys, we've got um, ballistics testers, BAE systems, mm -hmm, Leonardo, mm -hmm. um, so quite, you know, big industry partners. And we have um, partnerships with them, links with yeah. them. Um, so, you know, we, we help train their guys. They then send guys to us to assist with, um, you know, sort of long-term support uh -huh. to like our helicopter systems, for example. So, so we are integrated with them to, mm -hmm. to quite a significant extent. 
I, I would say. But yeah, there's, there's always room for improvement. That's brilliant. And, and I, I love the way that you talk about um, the fact that you need to customize the systems as well. Because I used to, this is back in the day, I used to work for um, Palantir Technologies as a, as a mere recruiter and an HR. So I didn't touch like technology like with a barge pole. Um, uh, but, but back in the day, there was a lot of procurement by the, um, by the American military, um, especially in terms of like analysis of like field data and almost like anthropological data about like where the different terrorist cells could be hiding. And uh, also back yes. then, the the drone footage and like AI analysis of that was kind of starting to come into play. So it was a really interesting time, which is like you know ten years ago. But I was. Um, yeah. The, the, the previous recording that we were doing um, uh, just before you was a, a guy from the like the, the, one of the Czech banks, and he was saying it really doesn't matter what data you have. You need like zeros and ones, and it needs to be in a good, secure place, and it needs to be like easily like interactable with. And the problem like of all these huge institutions, whether it's a bank or an army or a museum, is that you've got a huge amount of data, and just like having it streamlined so you could actually do something with it is a science like in and of itself. Um, <laughs> so I I. I feel that um, uh, your, your, your pain and that there must be a lot uh, a lot going on. By the way, I've got another question about the um, like private no. uh, state interaction because like obviously there's a, a, a huge part no. of the procurement that you have to outsource to the private sector. You're also like training your uh, in-house specialists. Um, but what about like actual mercenaries? Uh, like, because, because I've been trying to like read a little bit about like the history of the army um, and th there are, you know, a lot of discussions yeah, no. happening. Uh, you know, there's like... Uh, the, the ideas of like uh, new nation states emerging or the na notion of the nation state collapsing. But the obvious riposte to that is, well, what about defense, which is the very physical manifestation of a geopolitical yeah. entity? Um, but, you know, mercenary armies used to like saw that back in the day. So do you see a tendency of these mercenaries to like rise up more in the, in the modern day and age? Or maybe they just spoken about a little bit more? Like, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. So, so the Really, or uh, sorry, sorry, example, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Which I think wait, again, wait, wait. Is, you know, sort of widely understood. And, and, sorry, sorry. One second. Sorry, it just broke up. If you could, ah, got got you back. I'm really sorry about that. Okay. Yes, to start. Yeah. Yes, start again, please. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, with reference to mercenaries, um, the really obvious uh, group to talk about, obviously, is Wa the Wagner Group mm -hmm. or the Wagner Group, whatever you want to call them. So, um, a Russian, a private military company, PMC. Um, and they uh, basically were able to interact in this gray space and have been used, uh, uh, you know, pretty effectively actually by the Russian state. So, what they're doing in, uh, so you know, we, we've seen them. We could talk about um, Syria uh, and Iraq as well. But but what they've been doing in um, Bakhmut in Ukraine, or uh, well, they had been doing up to the point, is um, you know, effectively being being an extension of the Russian state by any other means, but with plausible deniability. And we'll talk about. West Africa in a second, but in, in back, back what they were doing is um, uh, was going around prisons uh, and hiring prisoners with the sort of promise that um, you know if you fight, fight for Russia for six months and then uh, you know after that you'll uh, you, you'll have your freedom. Whether that worked or not, uh, whether they did get their freedom, I mean the, the casualty rates around back boots were something, something like twenty thousand oh. uh, Russians, I think, or something like that have, have, have died there. So you know pretty horrendous, but. Um, you know, they're, but they're a very useful tool for the Russian state because, of course, you, you don't have to pay pensions. You know, it, you don't you don't have to pay. You don't have to worry about sort of the medical chain, all that sort of stuff. They're completely deniable. Mm. And deniability that brings me on to West Africa, mm -hmm. uh, where they, they conducted quite a lot of interesting activities. So again, I don't think it's sort of controversial to say that they've been hugely involved in uh, some of the recent coups that we've seen in West Africa. Um, and effectively, what 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 work that does their 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 selling point is that they'll come in and um, they will support the sort of the, the the ruling party, the ruling group, uh, or sorry, that they, they, they will support a group to become the ruling party mm -hmm, or the mm -hmm. ruling group. Um, so they're effectively coup specialists. So mm. you know they'll provide on the ground training and indeed sort of in person support, uh, and in return for you know being able to sort of enable any of this coup. Uh, they'll basically then get access to the uh, raw materials of that state. So whether it be diamonds, oh, gold, okay. uh, oil, whatever it is. But uh, and and by extension, Russia does right. Mm -hmm. So so that that that's that's the sort of that's a way of doing it. Um, when you talk about mercenaries, it's interesting because you know it's also interesting to think about Iran 
and their, uh, their the axis of resistance that they've developed, which is really interesting. So one of the the brainchilds of uh, General um, Soleimani, the the the, jet, the uh, IGRC general that was killed by the Israelis uh, maybe a year or so ago. Um, so his sort of thinking was that you want uh, you know surrounding Israel, you want this axis of arc of influence or mm-hmm. axis of resistance. Um, we can go into that a bit later, but that that's all about you know so, um, different levels of proxy. So you know Hezbollah being the sort of tier one. Um, most linked to Iran, huge amounts of support for Iran in terms of training, um, equipment, missiles, all that sort of stuff. And then sort of, you know, your tier two is sort of Hamas. Um, and as you can see from the 7th of October, it's really interesting, you know, the question of actually how how in control of Hamas are the Iranians. You know, there's mm-hmm. lots of stuff in, in The Economist about this, you know, how, how much did they know that it was going to happen? Uh, and then, you know, there's sort of third tier or lesser tier. And these are very, this is very much my own perspective on it. This isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Third tier is uh, so Ansar Allah, or also popularly known as the Houthis, um, who, you know, whilst uh, are, I'd say, sort of strategic partners of Iran, um, they very much do their own thing. They have mm-hmm. their own indigenous capabilities from, um, you know, leftover Yemeni munitions, um, you know, the, the ex Yemeni army of uh, President Salah. Um, you know, they're, 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 what they're doing in um, the Red or in the, the um, Baba Mandeb Strait, the, the, the Gate of Tears, uh, mm. as it's interesting to note, um, but arguably isn't really in line with what the Iranians want to do. So, you know, but are they, are they mercenaries in the same way? And so are probably not, but Hezbollah, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, it's not d- directly, but maybe directly. If you see what I mean, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's a complicated question. Um, and, you know, different states use proxy forces, violent non-state actors in different ways. But I think it wags, sorry, it's a very long answer to, to, to your Great. question. Um, <laughs> but I think wa- wa- Wagner, Wagner are an example mm-hmm. of how a state could use mercenaries. But, but obviously, uh, you know, that did slightly backfire on on Putin. I don't think as, as, as a British army, you know, we, we we have a mandate, I suppose, so, you know, a, a license to operate from the British people, from the British government. And so, you know, and that that is a sort of proto Rousseauian contract. Um, you know, we we can't conduct the sort of activities, uh, rightly, rightly so we can't, uh, that, you know, someone like Wagner can, could conduct. And if we were to support, and, you know, we do trade and support, um, not other violent non-state actors, but there are all sorts of ethical constraints that we have that the Russians don't necessarily have, for example. Um, so probably, you know, but but in terms of providing security, yeah, maybe it's just it's it's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to control mercenaries. So probably better to avoid them, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you opened up as you always do, which is why, ladies and gentlemen, it's you know so easy being uh, f- friends with Edmund for this long. It's incredibly hard. Someone save me! No, I'm joking. <laughs> You're the best. You're the best. Um, and uh, you always open up such interesting uh, topics of conversation. And you know we're we're talking about it, mercenaries on the ground, but the, the access of the uh, of the Wagner for a uh, group, for example, to the raw it, materials, which is of of course, also much more difficult to track um, than currency. And in the way that, um, for example, you know, I was thinking about things like how blockchain has been used in the diamond trade to track every single mined out diamond. To, it's like uh, origin of provenance. The same can be do- done for archaeology, right. by the way. But we'll 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 get into that. Um, yeah. Uh, but basically, like what you're what you're talking about is um, very obvious, uh, often very bloody uh, presence on the ground. Nonetheless, even with such mm. a like a difficult like um, uh, in-person conflict, the the kind of lines between the individual states and in the individual players involved do get very blurred. Because like yes, you might have the you know Palestine-Israel conflict, but suddenly you have countries from all over the world by proxy in some way engaging with them. Um, what happens then if all of this is happening in the cyberspace? Um, because if the Wagner's physically goes somewhere, then you know, like they're there. Um, but when you do have like another level of this of this kind of gray operating area, which is you know the the anonymous hacker group, um, uh, there's a lot of hackers that that do a lot of good, like uh, you know the, the, the white hat hackers that do it for a good purpose. But you, you do also have the ambiguous um, and the ones that that are basically are, are often paid off for uh, immoral things. So like with all humans, you have a whole scale of services that you can do in the cyberspace. But the level of anonymity um, and 
and the difficulty to to uh, track these these actors down, uh, I think is a huge game changer. Uh, at least, like my humble opinion In- of someone who doesn't understand it at all uh, for for the military. So yeah. again, sorry, uh, lo- long no. question or answer to what you mentioned, uh, but I'm curious whether you are also like in the state of either uh, training your top tier employees like like yourself, um, yeah. uh, the, the great major, um, or uh, whether you have in house specialists, or whether again you have some kind of um, uh, corporations like with NGOs or like these hacker groups where you also basically tackle the conflict in the cyberspace in, so, in one way or another. Well, that's a topic for the yeah, army. Um, sort of, say I can't talk in great detail. Yeah, of course, <laughs> you would have to kill me, Mister Bond. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, obviously, it's well known um, that we've got GCHQ, who mm-hmm. are a um, non-military organisation. Um, I think more of the the onus is sort of given to them. We also have a thing called the new cyber force, which again I can't really talk mm-hmm. about, but um, there is more of a focus on it um, because, because of its importance. You know that we have a focus on EW, so electronic warfare, which is much more about sort of blocking radio signals than it is the cyber stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think. Uh, I mean, it's interesting if you sort of uh, uh, compare and contrast what we do to say the Chinese army, for mm. example. They are all over the cyber thing, like at like terrifyingly so um you know and it's a real concern it's a real concern because you know if you have the ability to impact um you know a, a nation's uh, in- infrastructure their mm. you know roads traffic signals whatever all the way down to you know we, we joke in the british army that if someone were to stop mod or the minute modnet which is our email system closes down everyone basically goes home <laughs> so we do just <laughs> voice down modnet and then strike after that so you know I, yeah and again this is my personal opinion i think we are getting after it um you know we're, we're developing our cyber stuff but we're not we're not in the same sphere i don't think yet um but i, I hey i'm not i'm not an expert on it i mean apologies it's all right. Um, you're, you're, you're a busy man. It's, it's, I understand. You've got to keep yeah, that phone I, on. Yeah. It's, it's the army is texting me now saying, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the screen goes black. <laughs> just, a, yes. just a small poof Hand. in the background. Exactly. <laughs> Poke with a stick. <laughs> The shepherd's crook comes in from here. Well, yeah. Me- <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously it's not only my personal opinion, but the cyber thing, let me tell you. Yeah. I, I should have a little box here that says, these are all my personal opinions. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> we'll edit that in. It's not, not a problem. <laughs> um, I just want, yeah, so... But it, yeah, cy- cyber's a huge thing, and it is it is the future. You know, working in the cyberspace, I mean, down to messaging. Messaging is a really important one. So strategic communications. We do have a big group of people that do that. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a brigade, seven seven brigade, um, that really focus on that. So you know, all the way from you know the hardcore stuff, so like psychological operations, down to mm. just you know general messaging. Um, that's much more what we sort of focus on. But again, you know, the Russians, brilliant at it. Um, mm. Very very highly effective at creating disinformation and deep fake um you know content um yeah being able to influence uh you know western global north i don't like western globe the global north politics um is 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 is, is fascinating and it's something that we are aware of um and we're aware that we are not where we need to be um yeah, yeah. I can I can talk to other uh, British institutions though. I'm sure they're much better. <laughs> no, it's but it's interesting because again, it's like a you know Taylor's oldest time when you you mentioned GCHQ. Um, uh, really? it, it, remember uh, uh, Ian Standen? I was telling you about. By the way, go check out the episode that we, we have with him. He was uh, you know he was in the in the army for a, for a long time, and he yeah. was uh, he is now transferred to be the director of Bletchley Park. That like uh, un, until like the 60s, 70s, no one even knew what was happening. Like it was a deliric like None. couple of buildings. Um, obviously, like, you know, Alan Turing demon, demonized by uh, by the by the British state, but like the code cracking exactly. that was going on there, which played such a huge part, like in the Second World War. You know, this is coming up to a uh, hundred years ago. Is just yeah. uh, is just staggering, and it's it's interesting how uh, people because they don't see how it directly affects them, or like you know, at the start of the Ukraine yeah. crisis. 
I had this small group of uh, like really small, but some of the people there were phenomenal a group of like these technological partisans, you know, and we were uh, sending uh, sending some uh, like hardware to the front. Um, so so like like generators and phones and laptops and things like that. But we're also monitoring the cyberspace a little bit. Um, and one of the first um, kind of responses we had, you know, from the general public was, well, why would they care about me? You know, I'm just like a, a, a good old nobody. Like, why do they care about me? Well, A, like People. the degrees of separation in the cyber world are so so tiny um and also yeah. like all you need is just a nook to get into and then like suddenly the amount of information you have available or the scale at which you can do those minor operations is, is huge and you know the the thick of it which is a brilliant sitcom yes. I, the thick of it is just yeah, yeah. I was just I was, I was watching something about like a, a, the huge irretrievable data loss the other day. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, by the way, you need to watch that. It's a brilliant sitcom from British politics, and it reminded me of the time when I was uh, in in politics in like you know tw twenty fifteen to seventeen, and Cambridge Analytica was going on, um, and uh, you know like the political parties suddenly started using WhatsApp, and now you know almost ten years on, we've realized that WhatsApp absolute no go, like. It's showed even during COVID the amount of leaks that, you know, took place, like from number 10 yeah. about different discussions, the importance of encryption. So it's really interesting how from this like huge yeah. wave of techno optimism, people are like, okay, we also need to calm down a little bit. But my question mm. to you is whether because we do have, um, or at least we think we do, um, some kind of um, moral code in the Western world, and I don't like that um, categorization just as you, you don't, um, that we're actually stopping ourselves from being like on the top of the innovative pyramid, um, and there will be uh, you know other countries and other entities that do not shy away from being a lot more uh, active in the cyberspace, um, like China, like you mentioned, or Russia. So I'm just I'm just curious. You sorry, know, sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry, I lost you. I lost you there. Could you repeat the question, please? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was. I lost you there. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, yeah, I've got you now. Okay, perfect. So, sorry about this. Um, uh, perfect. Um, so, so yeah, so, so basically, my uh, my question was that um, you know, in the in the Western world, and I don't like that categorization as much as you do. Uh, we might have you know the higher standard of moral code. You know, at, at least at least we pretend uh, tend to do that. Mm -hmm. But that might give us uh, a lot of blockers, either in forms of regulation or certain or some ethical oh. things we're not happy to do when it comes to like you know surveying citizens or whatever whatever that might be. Uh, unlike yeah. China or Russia. And the question is, what is evolutionarily smarter? Um, and I'm just you know, curious whether that is an active debate that you're having in the army or like with yeah. uh, the politicians to be like, look, all these regulations coming out of like, you know, either, either EU, which doesn't concern you anymore or NATO, that's great. But we need to also protect this geopolitical sphere. So that must be a really difficult balance to strike, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a fascinating question. So I uh, go back to the classic thing to do in this situation is go back to Clausewitz, who was a, <laughs> a fashion thinker, um, you know, wrote, uh, you know, like the, the seminal work on, um, you know, war fighting. And he talks about, you know, uh, war fighting, violence, uh, obviously, uh, uh, are an extension of politics by other means. Uh, and he also talks about the the, the triumvirate, so uh, which is um, sort of the physical, spiritual, and moral components of fighting power. Mm -hmm. Um I think it's 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 the moral bit that that's really important here. So if you combine that with this idea that you know we're an extension of politics, um, the army armed forces are a tool of politics. It, they they sort of in and of and and should be used as such. Um, you know, in and of themselves, we shouldn't be making those sort of decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, and I think we we can make suggestions, but certainly not something that would you know uh, change things at the strategic level um but uh, and that's about the moral components as well i think it, i i feel quite strong you know one of the reasons i joined the army is because i think we um protect people mm -hmm. i think you know we we uh, sort of large largely represent society actually i've been doing some studies on this in terms of the ethnic diversity of the british army we are we are actually we do actually reflect almost exactly um british society mm -hmm. but i think you know in doing this and and, and being given the license to operate we need to uh, to be ethical, to be moral, mm, mm. Uh, you know, and and we need to find ways around uh, um, the fact that you know the, the Russians don't have a moral compass. But you know, I think for them, it, it will all come as as of all things, it all comes crashing down because if you don't have the support of your population, 
uh, you know, you then have to create effectively a, a sort of autocratic dictatorship, mm. which mm. Um, is fine until Wagner starts driving towards Moscow. Do you see what I mean? You know, <laughs> the, 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 almost no, uh, almost no resistance at all. Um, mm. You know, so, so so I think I think it's a really it's a really dark road to go down, and I don't think e- either it's a road that we need to go down necessarily because. And you know, in terms of so, NATO, let's talk about NATO. NATO, fantastic organisation. I've just come from a NATO job in Turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, this the, the new the NATO new force model, which again I can't talk about specifically, <laughs> but is truly terrifying in terms of the the numbers that NATO countries can mobilise mm. um, pretty, pretty quickly, actually, mm. and that the resources tanks, planes, all the way down to funding, you know, and movements of people is, is one of the greatest alliances that's ever existed. So, mm. um, yeah, great. You know, you, um, Russia, China, Iran, whoever, you know, they, they, they have these levers, but but they use these levers because they need to, because actually they can't compete in mm. terms of, you know, on, on the physical conventional battlefield, but like they'll, they'll get absolutely trundled. Mm. Um, as you see in as you see in Ukraine, you know the the the, the Grand Russian Army has been uh, stopped pretty pretty effectively um, by the Ukrainian people. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's it's a bit pig fighting, isn't it? You know, the, the, the pig wrestling. The only person yeah. that wins is the <laughs> is the pig. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, so you, yeah. you don't you don't want to go down that road. I don't think because we don't need to. Yeah. Uh, and the minute that we do, we we yeah we lose uh, we lose something really really important that is very hard to get back, which is the trust of the people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. By the way, this like dynamic and the army's place in society is something that fascinates me in general because mm. you know we we've been doing some research in my research group on uh, on on Plato and basically trying to find out and understand like social dynamics and the way that they change mm. around us. And in Plato's Republic, the fact that he creates a separate caste around the warrior and that the warrior and the concept yeah. of of heroism um, uh, and, and hubris oh. associated with those acts of heroism on the battlefield and outside of it is just a fascinating mm. dynamic that you know builds our culture like without people I think realizing whether that's fairy tales or legends or uh, the kind of historiographical historiographical narrative mm. of our governments and the fact that they often come from you know I- either kind of uh, loose cannon warriors like the kind of you know Robin yes. Hood or Zorro kind of vibe going on um, uh, to mm. the heroic acts of the army like you walk around Paris the Corn Armé is st- stamp- stamped on every single bridge and like Les Invalides you know yeah. uh, are, are one of the pinnacles of uh, of uh, Parisian architecture. So it's really interesting how the army uh, both is like uh, kind of singled out, like when, you know, budgets are discussed or uh, when it kind of like sets itself apart from society and often in past philosophies, but also it's absolutely integral, you know, that you mentioned protecting people to the day-to-day life of communities simply surviving. and I'd actually quite like to get back to uh, to our Oxford days where we had the leisure and the time and enough drunkenness and healthy liver to discuss these things. <laughs> God, such good times. Um, but also because, you know, uh, you uh, and I, I want to mention your personal story, not only because I'm incredibly proud of you as your friend, because you're, you're nailing it. And I'm so proud of you for this major promotion, um, <laughs> pun intended. Um, but also because, you know, I remember from first year, like you were you were so dedicated, you were going on all these like very gruel away days and weekends and, yeah. and now you're here talking about like the new cyber force so like you know you, you've really got like such a wide spectrum so I'm just wondering if you could enlighten the audience how that arm, army hey. journey actually looked like and how you keep up with all the new knowledge that is <laughs> flooding in like it's just incredible yeah sure no absolutely so um yeah so we uh, so we finished Oxford oh uh, gosh it was so September time, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, in 2013, and then uh, so I actually never, never technically graduated because uh, <laughs> I had to go straight to Santos, which was a bit of a shock to the system. So Santos is 11 months off to training. Um, so it just to, just about dragged myself through that. <laughs> uh, and then uh, so went, went to my unit, became a troop leader. Um, so you're in charge of sort of 15, 16 soldiers, uh, which was joyous, really, you know, f- absolutely fascinating as an activity. So you so did that for a sort of two or three years or so. Then I got sent out to Sierra Leone um, mm-hmm. as the 7th Brigade Liaison Officer to <laughs> Sierra Leone, uh, which is, uh, as you know, where, where I met my my wife, uh, Kat, who's an yeah. uh, uh, American aid worker from Kansas City, met at the British High Commission pool party uh, of all places. <laughs> Living the life. <laughs> I know, exactly. We absolutely dream. Um, you know, learn, learn how to speak Creole, which is the local language. Uh-huh. Um, it's a Creole language, but it's called Creole, K-R-I-O. Um, then came back to the UK. 
uh, then what did I do? Then I went to Perbright as an instructor. Um, uh-huh. So phase one training, so basically t- t- turning civilians into soldiers. Did that for about a year or so. Uh, then came back, went to a, went to a, a NATO operational tour called Op Kabrit to mm-hmm. Poland uh, for six months. So I was second in command of a, a, a squadron out there. Mm-hmm. It was called EFP, so Enhanced Forward Presence. So effectively, we were there to to deter um, Russian uh, aggression. So near the Slovakia Gap, which is the gap between Belarus and Kaliningrad. So mm-hmm. up there in northeastern Poland. Um, then I came back and went to London District, uh, which is based out of Horse Guards, uh, which was an absolute so um, privilege. <laughs> yeah, because I, I got to help with the so Op Fourth Bridge, which was the uh, funeral of uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, then I did up uh, Platinum, which was obviously the Platinum Jubilee. Um, following that, then went out to Turkey uh, with with, uh, with NATO, so headquarters land command out in Izmir, which was again fascinating. So got a really good insight into uh, you know what what how NATO works, um, and you know I became a, a land theatre advisor, which is very mm-hmm. interesting. So got to go on combat readiness evaluations, and truly amazing to be able to. Work with the the, the Turkish um, uh, NRDC Turkey, so NATO rapidly deployable core Turkey, uh, mm-hmm. very cool. And then got to work with the ARC as well, so the Allied Rapid Reaction Core. Nice. Um, after that, then yeah, so promoted to major and came to work where I am now in Shrivenham, which is the uh, <laughs> Shrivenham which is the... <laughs> from Izmir to Shrivenham. Sorry, no, no disrespect to the good people of Shrivenham. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's a lovely place, but it was flipping cold when I rocked up. You know, we get, went from. <laughs> 40 degrees um my son my son was born as you know my son was born out there so poor thing uh you get went from 40 degree heat glorious we had a large house and a swimming pool to uh to Shrivenham, which was i think minus three at the time um i almost died <laughs> um now now i'm here for a year uh no wrong and now i'm here for about seven months or so um, yeah. then i then i moved to job working in uh, main building so that's a very quick Sort of run through uh, yeah. of my, but but it's been hugely varied. Um, been really interesting, you know, and, and I, I I very much enjoyed, especially working with other other armies, um, other nations, and being able to get their perspective. You know, that's why I'm I'm going on to. Remember, we talked about the five career streams, uh-huh. so I'm going on to the the defense engagement slash management of defense ones um, because I think. Uh, I, I think that's where we're a very small army, the British mm-hmm. army, so uh, only about seventy six thousand or so, um, but we. Put, uh, we pack a big punch, uh, and we're, we're 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 experts in our trade. So I think what we can do, sort of moving forward, is uh, be able to send out small motivated, uh, you know, <laughs> groups to, to the men and women to go and train other armies and um, develop their capability to be able to fix this, to prevent problems before they before they arise. Um, that that's why that that's where I'm going at the moment. But you know, yeah, on on the way, I picked up a lot of stuff. You know, you, you listen in on conversations. Um, you know, always surrounded by uh, different cat badges people from different regiments different calls and you know you have these conversations and you just sort of pick stuff up um i mean i might i might i might be i might be completely wrong about everything that i said but <laughs> as with all the things the army's taught me if you say with enough confidence people tend to believe you <laughs> absolutely no no you are you are brilliant at that like the i, I, I remember <laughs> what, what you said like you know our degree that the best thing is if you ever get stuck you just wheel it back to the roman empire and like you're absolutely fine because <laughs> because no one cares I, about I, that I, anyway <laughs> well our degree was a degree in interesting dinner conversation basically which which is absolutely proven true yeah uh, if you're, if you're, oh, I just. Uh, a, um, oh, sorry. I, I, I just. And that'll that'll last you for about an hour. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> I just I just lost you, but it's good. I I heard the end of it. That's perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, w- one of the things I was probably like uh, most jealous of is you like gallivanting off to Ephesus when you were in Izmir and be like, oh look, yeah. Sarah, where I am. And also, oh, I remember when you went on your first kind of uh, de- deployment, or like like you know like you th- there was like a seeing action, like 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 you know hard training. Um, I was I was terrified because suddenly like it it clicks like you know when you were going on like your d- away weekends. And like you were basically like s- s- sleeping outside. I was like, oh, good for him. He will train himself. But, but then, like, when you were thinking, oh, God, there's like someone with a rifle potentially like against my best friend. Mm-hmm. I remember that was like a really stomach churning. Uh, like, uh, I remember that very vividly. It was like, 
Yeah, um, uh, obviously a few years back now, but um, yeah, you you be you be careful out there. But what is what is fascinating oh, is the um, the kind of like almost decentralization that the army is going through because obviously like, you've had mm-hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of budget cards. You're automating a lot of processes, um, but you're oh. also like training others. So like you know you're doing that whole decentral like the snowflake model, which is which is fascinating. Yeah. But um, also that means that you get to um, see a lot of you know different cultures. Um, obviously uh, the, the British Empire is very has been very successful in seeing. A lot of different cultures over the last uh, a couple of hundred years. So that brings me back onto the theme of like uh, anth- more anthropology than archaeology. Um, yeah. But but basically, like how the different. Uh, I, I think that your Oxford degree was actually fantastic in helping you, um, uh, you know, become as successful as you are in the army because you're not only uh, capable of understanding the local context, but also to uh, maybe understand what the strategy or what the type of engagement should be in order to make it the the most mm-hmm. effective. Um, which you know, at least again, I'm not, I'm not in the army. It's just my personal opinion. But which <laughs> the Americans are not always um, uh, as kind of flexible in because you know I grew up. Uh-huh. In Vietnam, and when you hear about the deployment, like into the Vietnamese theater of war, um, part, part of one of the reasons that was such a disaster for the Americans, comparatively, was um, because of the misunderstanding of the local guerrilla warfare, for example. So I'm just curious Absolutely. about um, how, how you feel that your degree has has helped you in mastering yeah. your task, <laughs> <laughs> mastering my craft. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think anthropology at its core is about people, um, and and the army at its core is about people as well. So um, you know, engaging internally with each other. You know, I'm very, very privileged to be an officer, but that obviously has um, a lot of responsibilities as well um, to be so. So you know, it's about understanding. You know, it's it's it highly likely that um, the guys and girls that I uh, men and women that I lead will be from different ethnic backgrounds, different uh, well, different genders, religion, um, you know, you name it, neurodivergent, all that sort of stuff. So so I think the backing that anthropology gave me, you know, understanding that there are different cultural logics mm-hmm. and people see the world in a different way, um, that, that was a huge, a really, really good baseline. Mm. I think then, you know, we talk about, and I think I think you're completely right on what you say, you know, we need to understand the local situation, but we need mm. to understand it in depth as well. So um, there's a very interesting um, book, uh, a cool, I can't remember what it's called, but it's on the, the, the Al-Anbar, the Al-Ansar uh, Awakening, mm-hmm, which is a part mm-hmm. of Iraq in, oh gosh, I can't remember, so the, the mid, mid to, uh, 2015 maybe. And basically what had happened was, uh, so... ISIS um, sort of you know, moved into the area. There was a huge amount of um, you know, uh, war fighting with the uh, US Marines, um, and then effectively you had this 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 awakening, this uprising, um, and what happened was the local sort of Sunni um, tribes rose at Shia tribe. I can't. Sorry, I'm really sorry. I can't remember which way around it is. They, they sort of all rose up, pushed um, Iran uh, ISIS out. Uh, and so there was this big, you know, study afterwards because you know the sort of the Americans assumed that so they didn't do anything different, um, so they didn't sort of quite understand what why that had been, and it was a huge amount of um, different different reasons why. I mean, effectively, it was actually about the control of the smuggling trade yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because ISIS were trying to, to take over the smuggling trade, and the local tribes weren't particularly impressed by that. But a lot of other stuff as well. Mm-hmm. ISIS were being pretty brutal. Um, you know they're they're exclusionary. Um, I think they're all Sunnis, ISIS is Sunni as well. But yeah, so 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 you had all these different sort of elements going on at the same time. And had the American military been able to uh, you know see that see that sort of fine detail, um, it's something that they could have potentially tapped into and uh, prevented the conflict or you know sped up the conflict. Um, mm-hmm. And the other classic example of the Iraq is the Bath. Uh, a, a bath party in the mm-hmm. army so we went into iraq um completely disbanded the iraqi army and then of course what you've got is a significant number of uh you know unemployed fighting age males who were disenfranchised it's unsurprising that uh, an insurgency ensued pretty quickly so you know i wonder had we had um you know the team of big team of anthropologists maybe the word but you know ha- had that had that understanding been um present in the uh, the planning before you know, we went into Iraq. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wonder whether it would have gone down the way that went down. Maybe it would have done. But, um, you know, I, I think with anthropology, it just gives you a lens, a tool, whatever you want to talk, you know, whichever way you want to see it, um, to, to, to approach your subject, um, not just the sort of army smashy smashy. When there's, you know, the army smashy smashy has its place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sure. And, um, yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, you know, but 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 in the modern world, in such a sort of complex and complicated society, we need to be able to um, see the fine grain, see, see the detail, and anthropology provides you that. I think. Nice. You, you, you just uh, had the best um, like sales record ever. Like for, for like, uh, <laughs> m- m- make sure that people sign up to Arcananth at Oxford is very good, yeah. and it gives you the fine Thank grain. You. <laughs> Thank you, Zach, and Best when, place to study. When we're t- talking about your your son, um, uh, bless him, and please send him my love. Um, we, we were talking with Ed last time we visited Prague. It's like, oh, you know, what are our kids going to study? And I was like, well, as long as it's not Cambridge and as long as it's Oxford. And you're like, no, I'll be much more specific than that. They are, have absolute freedom to study anything they like as long as it's Arkanath that's in yes. use. <laughs> <laughs> It's because you are, you are absolutely right. Like the because I feel that at least in the Czech Republic, we um, uh, a lot of people have PTSD from studying history that they like just didn't enjoy it at school. Oh, well. um, and the curriculums I think are vastly outdated. And uh, what what you mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned the complexity, but also the wars of proxy that happened. But it's not just proxy as in like one nation battling another, but it can be also such indirect warfare. Like I was reading a really interesting article about um, the fentanyl crisis in the in the uh, uh, U.S. And, yes. and it was an yeah, article yeah. about basically it's payback time, bitch, for the opium wars. Um, and but suddenly, if you start reading about the opium wars and basically yeah, yeah, the yeah. governor yeah, who yeah. once visited Hong Kong and he's like, oh, I really like it here. I'd really like to live here. Um, and the, the whole interaction that happened there during the first and the second uh, opium war, suddenly you start seeing the parallels. And especially because a lot of autocratic governments like the, the one in China derive from history or like referring back to history, it's a narrative that actually, you know, it's a question whether like how much is a correlation or causation or just like it's easy to manipulate others through drugs. But it is really interesting that this narrative has kind of popped up. And uh, if you combine then the uh, anthropology with also the historical knowledge, that gives you a complete like different understanding Uh of uh, like the psychology of the conflict and like how you can use the psychology of the conflict to also manipulate it to potentially your advantage. Um, Another thing I was, uh, you know, how we went on the um, excavations to Guatemala this summer. Um, we yeah. were uh, we were basically um, I was trying to kind of like you know learn about like the uh, the kind of lo- local political and social history and for example like the the American um, uh, effect that like just through the fruit company uh, you know tr- trading fruit and taking a monopoly on bananas it was crazy and basically like <laughs> then like the comparison with the uh, civil war that was r- raging on for you know forty years a lot of the Maya um, uh, ethnics completely kind of like wiped out and yeah part of it was bananas part of it was the Colombian marching powder, but you know, like that complete like war of proxy that was happening there for so many decades, <laughs> um, creating political vacuums. You know, not respecting the mm-hmm. local, um, you know, like uh, original kind of like Maya historiographical kind of approaches was so, just so interesting. So I, yeah, I keep I keep thinking. Well, I think of you all the time anyway because I miss you. You need to live <laughs> in the Czech Republic. Come, come with Cat and your son. Come, um, uh, but also because uh, I, love, I love Prague. I absolutely love Prague. I was, the best. It's brilliant. The, it's, uh, it's very fun. The gold the, shout the, out to the, the, the golden, golden tiger. tiger. <laughs> Oh, my favorite place. It's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. I, I love how, because they bring the beers, right? Like whenever like you're not looking yeah. and you finish and you're like on your fifth, what? like, what? <laughs> I know. I know. You don't even feel full. It's incredible. Pills to Urkel. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> it's so tasty. Look, mate, I, I went to, I returned from the UK yesterday and I was like looking at the price of pines and like, ah. Uh, Oh. Condolences. Ah. It's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, though. What's very exciting is that we've discovered um, that the, the officer's mess has uh, <laughs> highly subsidised uh, beers. So my, my, my mother-in-law was staying uh, over over this weekend, uh, and Kat and I very much enjoyed those uh, you know, subsidised beers. Fantastic. Brilliant stuff. Cheaper. So join the army and enjoy subsidised beers. <laughs> Again, this is not the tagline of the British Army. This is, this is, that, 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 that. <laughs> I, I love that. Are, are you are you doing anything to tackle, you know, hackers? Yeah, I can't talk about it, about the new cyber force. <laughs> also join the army and enjoy subsidized beer. Anyway, bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, actually, I have a uh, oh, I have a way of taking this uh, to technology and archaeology. Do you want to do you want to hear it? I'm fascinated to see how you're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was I was uh, reading up on uh, Mesopotamian hymns the other day. As, as you do, as, as you do. Uh, but you you know me. I'm I'm a, I'm a bit 
Um, uh, and no, no, no friends. Um, so all alone, <laughs> just like reading Wikipedia. Um, and I was reading that one of the one of the like first hymns to be to be recorded on clay tablets was a recipe for cooking beer. And obviously, we can interpret beer as a type of technology that or a social lubricant that you know holds society together. Yeah. But also, if in the hymn you have the actual recipe, then no one can dick you around in yeah. terms of like doing it wrong. Or like if civilization disintegrates, you will always know how to make that beer. And anyway, right. the way that I want to uh, wrap that into a discussion on technology and archaeology is that I, I, I remember uh, there was a Czech newspaper the other day and they published um, something about the collapse of civilizations, right? And you know who they quoted? They quoted Gibbon about the, around the Roman Empire, which is the goddamn 18th century. I was like, uh, I think we've moved on a little bit since then in terms <laughs> of like <laughs> defining like civilizational like aspects. But what was interesting that like, you know, until like the early 20th century, the way archaeology approached like past civilizations was do they have monumental architecture? You know, do they have writing? Do they have like a scaled army? Like whatever that might be. Neither. And I was actually wondering, and it kind of ties into the army thing as well, but also much more to, yeah. to our degree, how technology has been often misunderstood and its role in society to actually define um, the, I, I guess, uh, level of advancement of the civilization. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for example, in guerrilla warfare, a lot of the times those, you know, those folks have uh, often much inferior technologies to the, you know, potentially invading yeah. army, like the whole Vietnam-US scenario. Um, but it's about like the other, like social mechanisms as well that, you know, end up um, being victorious. So I was just wondering, like, it's a very open-ended question. You can go off on, on <laughs> any rant you like, but I'm just curious is how, from the archaeological historical perspective, you kind of uh, see the interplay of tech and society. <laughs> Small questions. <laughs> well, so, so from the so the, the the integration of technology and society. Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's usually intellect, right? Like you know, if you've um, if you've got a technology that allows you at a very basic level, a technology that allows you to. Uh, produce surplus that's mm -hmm. huge right like mm -hmm. so you know the wheel for example you know, instead of uh, a, a man or woman have to carry something on their back yeah great you've got a you've got a horse but actually if you've got a wheel the horse can pull a cart mm -hmm. and you know so sort of exponentially or you know, the cutting of canals for example use use of boats to to move stuff so Technology in that capacity is 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 hugely hugely important. I think, um, you know, but 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 you're right. You know, we can we can we can misunderstand it. So mm -hmm. one of the, one of the things that I find fascinating is that I think it's the Maya they they didn't have writing. If you consider writing a technology, which mm -hmm. I sort of do, um, you know, they, they they had the um the system of um not sort of string. Oh no, that was the but, that was the Inca, the Kipu. Yeah, it's, I'm so sorry. It's being, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, fine. It's fine. Yeah. It, your your uh, head, head's full of beer and new cyber force. It's absolutely fine. Well, I, I, know, I don't blame you. <laughs> I'm desperately trying not to get told off by the eye. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm so sorry. We'll start that again. Yinkers. Yes. Um, you know, so, but you know, widely understood because uh, so the antiquarians went out there and they tried to find writing that we well, didn't find any. Therefore, you know, fallacy, fallacy of the undistributed middle. If there's no writing, they can't be uh, complex and developed. Therefore, you know, X. And, and it's in that space that you don't get conspiracy theories, right? You know, these brilliant ones of, you know, well, there's no way the Egyptians possibly could have built that, you know, the, the pyramids. Therefore, it's aliens. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, whatever it is. So, so I think technology can also be hugely misleading mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, I think also, you know, technology. Is is it as logically we interact with things in a very very different way, right? Mm. You know, so um, you know, social media. Now you know, I, I think about uh, so we just started to to show my son uh, Bluey, which is this um, you know, uh, so it's a little blue dog thing. It's actually brilliant. I really love it. Very, very, <laughs> it's just very, very glued to the TV. <laughs> Yeah, but well, uh, my my wife and I were watching one. Uh, we just went, went for a run this uh, the, this afternoon. Came back and you know we had ten minutes. And I was like, oh, let's chuck chuck a bluey on. Anyway, um, but you know, but he's going to grow up with uh, you know just screens everywhere. However much we desperately try to reduce, you know, he he is going to be so in. Uh, involved with technology for the whole of his life so you know he's almost not going to be able to see the the wood from the trees right like mm. there, there, there isn't going to be necessarily that separation um you know ai is another fascinating one on our course we're allowed to use ai but you're allowed to use it as a as a search engine you know to sort of like to, to begin the conversation mm. and you know for my son actually now uh, you know how much would you use google because if you can 
just chuck that same question into AI and it will give you much more of a response. Um, you know, and obviously one critically has to look at it in terms of how, how the sort of response that AI gives you. But, um, but you know, if you were in the hundred, two, two, three hundred years time, you know, looking at the way that we interact with technology, um, you don't necessarily get all the detail that, or you know, the the, the insights that, that that you would do if you look at it purely from an archaeological perspective. You've got to have that anthropological uh, perspective as well. Um, I realise I haven't really directly answered your question. No, you have. You, it, you have. Oh, like nobody, nobody would have known. Like you answered it perfectly, <laughs> and yeah, you actually opened up a a, a great a great thing there because um. Um, uh, it, it kind of actually goes back to the whole thing of the army because uh, I, I was, yeah. I was l- looking at this meme recently how um, if you are in Washington near the capital is the probably only place in the world where you get billboards like advertising uh, products from Lockheed Martin <laughs> and it's yes. often about like the you know the military might and like basically like having the yeah. bigger rocket than the big guy you know Oppenheimer was in the uh, the theaters recently so like you know the race yeah. for the uh, for the atomic bomb which was the cutting edge of um uh, of technology back in the day, but often that is actually not about having just the uh, like high tech stuff. It's about being able really? to use it, being able to understand the way that society interacts with it. We, you know, you mentioned the Inca. We we had uh, again during the uh, Gu- Guatemalan uh, expedition. Uh, I actually felt ashamed as an archaeologist that it didn't fully click until you see it on the ground. Uh, they that there was right. no metal smelting. They they didn't use the wheel. Yet alone, they had like um, yes. these highways that were like twenty five meters wide. Um, they just went like straight through mountains and they didn't even like use the wheel. They didn't have any smelting process. So technically they were stuck in the Stone Age. They did. But, but, but like mm. they were so much more advanced than a lot of the, you know, Iron Age uh, societies that we see. So, so the constant like technological arms race, I don't think is necessarily um, complementary with the social race that is, you know, that is happening. Yes. And how happy people are, the, the way that you can like re-educate people, re-skill people, whether people are just like goddamn happy. I know this sounds like really uh, hippie-ish and wanky and emotional, but like honestly, like people are not keeping up with the rate of exchange of information anymore. You know, you've got me- Messenger, WhatsApp, yeah. Signal, yeah. everything, and it's just too much for our uh, Australopithecine brains pretty much. So I think for the army, it must be, that's why I was kind of, I'm really glad it, it came together. I didn't know how it was going to go, yeah. but it came together beautifully. This yes. podcast I did is we're tuned in. Is that, um, uh, yeah, it's not just about the arms race, but it's, it's about the... Um, I want to say human race as well, but then that just comes across eugenic. Yeah. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> so I mean, it's interesting, um, just sort of to just to jump onto one of your points there, because I think you made some really interesting points. The um, Dunbar's number is a big one. Yeah, here yeah, for yeah. Me. yeah. So uh-huh. um, for viewers that don't know, hundred Dunbar's number is roughly 150 people, so you can have a social relationship with. A, you know, a direct social relationship with up to 150 people. Beyond that, it gets far more difficult. So you have, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers, like three or four close friends, 15 associates, now 150 other people. So um, you see this a lot in the army. So uh, mm. a company, a squadron tends to be a unit of around about 150. I mean, you go back to the Roman army, and they had uh, centurions of 100, not 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 eight, uh, not 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 uh, sort of 80, not 100. Um, interesting enough. Okay. Um, really, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. That's very, yeah, very, very disruptive. Um, but what's, but what? So, so it's sort of ways that we sort of as humans interact with technology are really fascinating. You know, social media is fascinating, right? Because now you've gone well beyond Donbass number. You, you have. <clears throat> A social relationship, arguably, with all of the people on your Facebook group. They're all your friends, mm-hmm. quote unquote. But, but what um, Facebook does, oh, God. Oh, <laughs> what just happened there? Well done. I mean, your Great point was that. so good. That that's just yeah. like, congratulations from Google Meet that's, happening. That's, a, that's amazing. That's so clever. Um, <laughs> I completely lost. That's my point. The, the Dunbar number okay. and social media. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> with social media, you can. <clears throat> What social media does it 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 it, it extends your neocortex effectively. So mm-hmm. it says, you know, hey, you don't have to think about these social relationships. I will keep these social relationships. I'll make it really easy because I'll give you a profile of all the people so you can quickly click back, have a look, and even easier than that, here's some photos of you with that person. You know, so so, so that that allows you to um, sort of emotionally, cognitively extend your your um, group. But mm-hmm. what, what's but what it comes back to, you know, is 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 the fact. Yes, that's all that stuff's great, but um, in an army context, we are still all aware of the importance of social relationships. That's why you have, you know, platoons of thirty people broken down into three 
um, sections of no more than about 10, why you have troops of no more than four vehicles, all that sort of thing. Because, um, you know, whilst whilst technology is, is, is all powerful, absolutely it is, um, it doesn't, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's still a tool um, yeah. that, that we use and uh, we need to be able to use it effectively. And, you know, as I said at the beginning of this um, talk, you know, we uh, if we lose it, we still need to be able to function. Yeah, um, yeah. Absolute. Oh, this is a fa- oh, this is fascinating because uh, I, I always try to like in my very humble and uh, often unsuccessful quest to uh, blend archaeology and anthropology with tech in the the, the breeze that I endlessly chat. Um, what I try to tell <laughs> what I try to tell people is that technology isn't just um, the kind of like digital stuff. It's also you know obviously like a- analog things like whether that's the steam engine or, yeah. or whatever that may be, and the social implications like the writing of Das Kapital that had because you had an emergent new. Uh, uh, group of workers, but also it's the like internal technology of human beings because we are machines to a certain degree. And uh, thanks sure. to epigenetics, technology has a huge um, a- effect on us. But also like evolution is slow in a lot of respects. So mm-hmm. so the, the the kind of pressures of the constantly changing technological world around us versus what we're actually capable of um, is is fascinating. And I love the because mm-hmm. the army is life or death. Uh, yes, you can have like you know AI infused to every cell of your body. But at the end of the day, if you lose contact with everyone and it's just you and two of your mates from your platoon, like in the middle of nowhere, you've got to be able to function. Um, and yeah, yeah. so it's, it's just fasc- fascinating the way that like evolution, anthropology, history, archaeology, Brilliant. and tech all kind of comes into one. Um, and of course, the Roman Empire is a, uh, it's a beautiful example of, uh, of military <laughs> functioning in society as well. I love that you brought that, that up. That- there's um there's you know we we had a really interesting talk from a chap called Ian Ian Gardner mm-hmm. um who fought uh, in, uh in the Falklands um served in the Omani Sultan's army all that sort of thing and he talks about uh, very interestingly and the, the, the lots of people talk about this is basically you know what what motivates you to fight um you know and so people thought you know you can have grand moral ideas all that sort of stuff but you know what what really motivates you to you know, charge that machine gun position, get out of your trench, walk, mm. walk forward, all that sort of stuff. And it, you know, what it comes down to is, is your, is relationships. And mm-hmm. so your, your relationship with, with, you know, the person to your left and the person to your right, when you get down to that, um, you know, sort of level. So I think that, you know, t- technology is hugely helpful, but, um, you know, it, the, the social relationships and especially, uh, when you're in a high pressure scenario, which is what the army tends mm. to be, um, you know, it, it's really important to, to to maintain and to just continue to think about. So yeah. we we yeah. do a lot of work now on um, diversity and inclusion. Um, really importantly, because you know it's called op, op teamwork is is the sort of the project, uh, and that's all about you know how we interact with each other, how we ensure that we have a positive work environment, how we ensure that you know people feel included because it's very easy. You know, I'm very aware of my own status as a you know cis uh, straight. Ish white male, <laughs> <laughs> white ish, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't, I, and I, as you know, so I don't have um, the ability to access other people's, um, you know, experiences, and so um, that that's why the what we're talking about the social relationships are so important, and you know, you, you technology can't fill that space necessarily. Uh-huh. It can help, um, you know, it can help us think about it, but it, it can't, it can't fill it, and so you know, it and. That's the worry then when you start to get down to the use of technology in the army. So, mm. you know, we haven't talked about it yet, but the use of, um, you know, autonomous drones. Uh, I was literally about autonom- to, yeah, that was yeah. my next question. Go for it, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's it is interesting what you know. So we're talking a lot about um targeting so AI, AI is fascinating, right? Um and so as we were talking about earlier, when you've got a massive, massive data set, you can use AI to, you know, quickly process it to you know find patterns, all that sort of stuff. Great. And then it can, you know, off- offer you targets. What's worrying or, you know, what 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 where it starts to get a bit mist dark or gray area um is when you start to have automation of processes. So yeah. automation of targeting. So effectively there, there's a really good um series on this called uh Class of O nine. It's on mm-hmm. Disney Plus. Really, really interesting. So that's all about the automation of law law enforcement. Um there's a sort of minority report esque, basically. Mm-hmm. But the idea being that, you know, if you've got enough pings, uh, the drone, whatever that's flying over wherever, um, would uh, the, the, those pings? You've had enough ones, of, mm. and uh, to be like, yeah, you know, I'm going to execute that target. 
or you know you've got a remote weapon system moving down the battlefield and you know it's making the choice to drive left drive right you know shoot into that building you know because the probability is there are civilians but you know it just it it it's it's quite it's quite a scary world you know war fighting is um is a deeply human uh deeply human deeply personal thing and i think when you take when you start to automate it, I mean, we've been automating it from the get go, right? Mm. Um, and this is one of the things. I was yeah, but I'll finish this point first. When you automate it, um, it starts to get a bit difficult. That being said, um, you know, we've been creating killing what I call killing space from the get go, right? So, you know, your basic is two, let's say, men um, fighting each other, which is fists. So, it's, you know, you're, you're you're close, and then someone comes back with a club. Uh, the other guy comes back with a spear. Uh, the other has about the bow and arrow, and so what you see is is a movement um, sort of away from each other. Mm. So a move, sort of an extraction, and what fills that gap is technology. Um, so now we've got a, a scenario where you know you can have someone in an ISO container in Colorado uh, controlling a drone that's you know conducting strikes in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, so that that killing space is is is, is huge, huge, huge now, um, and you know and that that creates a. Um, disenfranchisement mm-hmm. uh, sort of separation um, from something which is you know fine not, not necessarily a problem but um, it turns war into more of a and, you know, button pushing exercise which it has its own moral component to it that we need to be um, you know really really aware of um, yeah yeah, oh, this is perfect, and you absolutely yes um, predicted like the best of AIs. Um, <laughs> are you AI person? Are you avatars? Yeah. <laughs> but you absolutely predicted my next question, which was about um. So, so basically, like in the the new series of pioneers talks, um, I uh, at the end of the uh, discussion, I want to ask um the, uh, the the partner in crime about what they envision in their particular field of work, the ultimate yeah. dystopia or utopia, and one of those things. Was was like the externalization of decision making because it's 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 interesting with um with you know like like all, all quite on the western front or like like all these like heart wrenching want- records from either the first or second world war that's you know very close to us here in europe but absolutely not close to to other cultures but but you see that there's like almost this dignity of okay like if i'm going to kill someone i'm going to do it quick you know or like it's it's kind of like man to man or woman to woman and there's this kind of like a uh, sense of not, i'm not want to say like fair play but even though like it's the bloodiest of wars you might not want to stab someone in the back un- unless like the uh, situation is is like absolutely, you know, febrile and, uh, and 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 desperate. But what you talk about is um. Uh, you know, and I, I get these questions a lot about AI. It's like, oh, you know, a- AI is basically like, is it evil because it does create this killing space? And it's like, well, AI is basically a glorified Excel spreadsheet. Um, but what it does do is takes away uh, that responsibility, and to to a certain extent, it's almost um. Oh. Uh, like degrading if you get shot by someone who's, you know, 10,000 miles away. It, it, again, it brings up a lot of moral right. and e- ethical questions that are, you know, very, very difficult to to answer. At the same time, what is, you know, in one scenario, a killing space can then, thanks to technology transfer, become actually like a saving space through, for example, like remote surgery that's being, you know, all like remove yeah, that- uh, r- uh, remote uh, drones, like especially like, you know, Zipline used to do this in, in sub-Saharan Africa, the delivery of blood or or any vitals yeah. so it's a re- it's such a double edged sword and i'm just i'm just curious like how you you know as edmund i know that you mm. obviously can't speak for the army but as edmund uh, with all the richness of knowledge you have the richness of experience uh, the kind of dystopic or utopian um future yeah. with the constant kind of like technologi- technologization oh, sure. of the army how you how you perceive that so i think the utopia is is a system where we're also having conversations mm-hmm. um you know I, uh, that are aided and abetted by ai but but ai is in the background it's a supporting element mm-hmm. so um you know if you look at something like the eu for example um we're still fighting within mm. the eu uh, mm. you know but now we're fighting over the shape of bananas or <laughs> you know the subsistence rate of milk yeah. As opposed to invading each other, mm. you know. So, I mean, it's a bit of a trice example, but I think it 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 it, it reinforces the point. You know, the, the interactions have changed now. Um, mm. You know, we're, we're we're far more interlinked and interdependent. I think, and a, a utopia for me would have something w- 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 would would look like that would would have even more interconnection. You know, moving towards, uh, you know, not necessarily a breakdown 
of nation states. I don't mm-hmm. think you know um, that that's a, a required uh, element for a utopia. But um, you know, just somewhere where where we are all interconnected. You know, and, and people realise that. Um, and so once that realization is made, I mean, it's quite Buddhist almost, once that realization is made, you, you understand that actually it's far more beneficial to interact uh, than to, you know, conflict with each other, to fight each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a dystopia is something that I, I wish I would talk about Disney Plus again. I recently watched the new film, The Creator, mm-hmm. really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's how, you know, they talk, they discuss AI and the use of AI. And, you know, he, uh, the, the main character um, is, goes to um, this sort of place and they've got sort of AI policeman mm-hmm. uh you know and uh and ai sort of robot you know uh, i think that's dystopia for me because i think something like policing is uh is a hugely again a hugely personal hugely um uh, yeah it's hugely personal process and i think with with ai i think ai at the moment certainly you know you you get out what you put in mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. And, the, and the problem is if you put in rubbish yeah, if you put in racist thoughts, if you put in, um, you know, uh, th- uh, the the things that work for the ruling one percent, mm. you know, it's not going to r- work for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm really cautious of of AI in that capacity, um, because I think it can be skewed, and it can be skewed by the people that that are using it, that are in control. You know, whether you talk the people that write the code, the people that have the servers, you know, mm. it's it's not. Um, it's 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 not independent. It's not autonomous. Whilst we think it's autonomous, it's it's not. It's someone's always controlling it. So so I think that that would be that'd be a dystopia for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think. But you're right. You know, the remote remote delivery of stuff like aid. Um, you know, water. I think uh, med- medical stuff. Absolutely fascinating. If you can, you know, control. And we can do it now. You know, if you mm-hmm. can control surgeries from you know two different consonants i think but you know hey ai actually if you can you know have an ai surgeon that Mm. has you know the experience of thousands and thousands of surgeons and surgeries you know actually the human body is is only put together in so many ways Mm. right there'll be variations but not that many you know that 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 could be a hugely hugely powerful thing Mm -hmm. i think moving forward but yeah so dystopia over-reliance um utopia uh use of uh, mm-hmm. or yeah uh, uh, use of ai in support i think yeah. nice that, that that is that is beautiful i mean it, it reminds me when you were when we went onto the medical field for a bit again um you know in the loop film <laughs> Um, when, 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 yeah. when they're sitting in the back of the of the limousine and they've just fabricated the evidence for the Iraq war and like the minister's asking like should I resign or should I not dis- resign and he's saying you know a, a war isn't always bad like the Crimean war we got nurses out of that <laughs> so like you know Florence Nightingale so it was just <laughs> a bit, <laughs> so, so so yeah but what, what I think that we have and well actually you have beautifully demonstrated um, uh, in this in this video cast and thank you so much for, for coming on is is that um, yeah, absolutely? Like in any walk of life, of course, um, you. you know, technology can be used to augment the experience, to make it uh, more uh, automated, to make it more precise. But at the end of the day, unless you actually understand the humans and use that to facilitate more of a human openness, which is often you know difficult for people, and uh, help people speak the same language, as utopian as that sounds, like we're not going to get anywhere. We're just going to be killing each other just with better rocks. Um, so, uh, Edmund, I uh, wish you. Oh, I'm, again, I'm so proud of you um, for for everything that you've achieved. You. Um, who who would have thought when I when I saw you passed out in the pub? And <laughs> joking, who would have thunk? <laughs> Cl- cl- climbing a tree in St. Hugh's grounds and just look at us now, eh? And just Talking look at us AI. now. You know, it's like that meme, hey, look at us, look at us. <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of you. You've you've spoken like a, a lot, like a, like a um, master on, on all of these things. And I, I really, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm just trying to be really nice, but I'm just coming across as a massive douchebag. Um, I don't like it. You don't need to be nice. It's fine. We've known each other for far too long. Yeah, that, that, that is true. <laughs> all, all right. Th- thanks, man. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. No, and it's... ladies and gentlemen, whether it's uh, the siege of Constantinople, the Crusades, the Roman legionaries, uh, or the modern use of AI in um, in remote um, drones and uh, and targeting, you can see that the humans and technology uh, and the military also have always been connected. And there's uh, one person that I know who understands all of those things, and that's Edmund. So <laughs> thank Thank you, Edmund, for being here with us today. And uh, look after yourself and send my love to your family. Thank you very much. Look after yourself as well. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.